He is the popular Mike Florio from Pro Football Talk Live, co-host, ProFootballTalk.com. Joining us from, uh, I believe, the barn in West Virginia. Are you handyman around the house there, Mike? Absolutely not. Absolutely <laughs> not. No, no, no. My dad taught me at a young age that there are people out there who have families who rely upon the revenue that comes from fixing things, doing stuff. So stimulate the economy, help people keep their families, hire someone to do these things. Uh, camps are opening up a little bit. Facilities are opening up, but this isn't universal here, Mike. Um, I, I'm surprised that the commissioner, is he going to say something about this? Or is there any unfair advantage with some of these teams having facilities open and other ones not? Well, this is the first moment where the NFL has reached a point of disparity, Dan. 22 teams or thereabouts are in a position where state and local governments will allow them to open. Not all of them are opening right away, and some of them may take a little while. But 10 teams or thereabouts can't open at all. And look, there are going to be many situations like this. If the NFL is intent on getting 256 regular season games played, there will be disparities. There will be competitive disadvantages. And the NFL is smoothing this one out by saying, no coaches are permitted at any team facility, but still, you've got teams that can fire up the lawnmower, get things rolling again, begin the process of planning for next year's draft, next year's free agency, have front office people there, have meetings, et cetera. And as we get closer and closer to the start of the season, Dan, I think we're going to see more of it. And the worst case scenario, and I think we have to be ready for it, some states where stadiums will be open and thus there will be a home field advantage. Other states where stadiums won't be open and teams will have no home field advantage. And I think that's unavoidable, but that's the, the extreme example of where there will be disadvantages as the NFL tries to play this season. Which stadiums do you think will have fans this upcoming season? Well, I mean, look, and I'm trying to be apolitical here, but we have all been paying attention to the states where there is more commercial activity despite the pandemic. I think Florida, Georgia, Texas, those are states that I would point to and say it's likely that the stadiums will be open. And the message will be, we know the risks. You know your health situation as well as anyone. If you want to come to the game, come to the game. If you think you're at risk, don't come to the game. And I think states like that are more likely to have stadiums open. California, New Jersey, states that are likely to not have stadiums open. And, and yes, there will be a disparity. And, uh, you know, teams will have to ask themselves, do we want to stay at home for the season and play in an empty stadium? Or do we want to go somewhere else where we could sell tickets? I mean, I don't know how robust the fan base is going to be if you move the 49ers to Arizona for the year. But that's part of it, too, because you could have some fans versus having no fans at all. But I think that's going to be one of the practical realities as we get deeper into the count. The NFL engineers and a sports equipment company, Oakley, are looking at surgical mask here or the, the N95 material for these guys to, is that going to be under your face mask here is a possibility? Yeah. I don't know whether it's like a covering for the face mask. Remember that mask that Justin Tuck used to wear where yeah. it was so tight. You couldn't even get a finger through it if you wanted to. I mean, will they paste it over top of that? Will be these, I think there'll be some players who say, I don't want that. I, I want my face mask. I don't want to have this thing where I'm going to have a hard time breathing. I'm not worried about getting the coronavirus. You're going to have some players who feel that way. You may have some players who want the extra protection. And then, of course, the guys who take the extra protection are going to be targeted to have their faces spit on by opponents. I mean, we know how football players are. They're not going to, they're not going to, oh, bro, oh well, we're going to respect the guy who's wearing the surgical mask. No, they're going to try to rip it off of his face and, and make him freak out because all's fair in football. At least that's going to be the mindset that some players have. So th this to me is, uh, it's got the potential to go a lot of different ways, but we have to accept the fact that football players are still going to be football players. And if there's a guy out there wearing surgical mask material, there's going to be somebody else out there trying to rip it off of his face. Talking to Mike Florio, Pro Football Talk Live, co-host with Chris Sims. I was wondering about this, Mike, as we looked at the schedule in those first four weeks, and I was given a heads up. Look at the first four weeks and see if there's a way. Are there going to be NFC, AFC matches? Are there interconference, interdivisional, location of all of those things? And I started to wonder, okay, if we took those first four weeks and we moved it to the back of the schedule there, if the NFL, would they would they take that approach if it meant we would have a chance at fans in the stands? So we, we, you're going to postpone this and move it to the back. So that gives us an extra month 
to kind of figure this out. Uh, your thoughts on, on that approach here? Absolutely, Dan. Absolutely. I think the NFL would explore delaying the start of the season, even if that means removing those first four weeks and tacking them on to the back end of the schedule. If it allows from a political standpoint, not red state, blue state politics, I'm talking about working with the governors, working with the processes and the protocols behind the scenes to get people comfortable with taking the position, stadiums are open if you want to show up. If that extra month makes enough of a difference that all stadiums will be open, I think the NFL is conducive to doing it. But Dan, on that point, something else I noticed in the schedule, I think it's been constructed where if, if they don't think delaying the first four weeks altogether would be beneficial, I think they are hell-bent on going forward with week one. When you look at all those great games that are scheduled for week one, yeah. go with week one and then take a step back and reassess. And if, if something goes haywire, you can take the week two games. And all the teams that play in week two have buys the same week. You can push all those back into the bye weeks. Week three, week four, no divisional games. They can be wiped out or they can be tacked onto the back end. But I think if they do go forward with the schedule and without a delay based on, as you suggested, a full month to let stadiums open, it seems to me that they are ready to go week one and then they would be willing to take a step back and see if any adjustment is necessary based upon the consequences of playing a full slate of games. The Rooney rule uh, surfaced again, and now there's incentive for teams if they're going to interview minority candidates and maybe we improve your you know, draft stock or we give you an extra draft pick here. I wonder if this just came down to Eric Bieniemy not getting a head coaching job and, and you know, to get interviewed. And, and maybe it's just one of the points, but here he is, a great offensive coordinator with the best offense in football, and you have other people who are getting jobs here, and Eric Bieniemy did not get a job. If Eric Bieniemy gets the job, is the Rooney rule working? Well, I think it's one of the factors, Dan, that contributed to the critical mass that caused people to realize something needs to be done, both as to coaches and as to general managers. Something Coach Dungey told me yesterday, the broadcast of the draft this year was a key factor in this decision to make real changes because we saw the contrast. The players' homes, the general managers' homes, and that contrast, that, that lack of diversity among coaches and front offices came through loudly and clearly now that we had cameras in the homes of so many of the coaches and the GMs, that that actually was a major factor in pushing this forward. And I don't know which proposals are going to pass, but the idea of giving incentives, giving enhanced draft status for teams that actually make minority hires, there's a lot of opposition to that. Coach Dungy is against it. And I think the best move would be to table that one and allow for more discussion, more ideas, maybe other ways to address the problem, short of creating a reward, as Coach Dungy says, for doing the right thing. Yeah, I don't like the reward, and I agree with Tony that it sends the wrong message. I just hope that you get more minorities in coordinating positions. I think that's really the key, and getting, you know, if they're head coaching jobs in college or you become a coordinator, and that ability to be able to then move up and become a head coach, because Eric Bieniemy should be a head coach in the NFL. And hopefully we'll get that opportunity. And I've said before, Mike, not every assistant coach coordinator deserves to be a head coach. You know, Romeo Cornell, I don't think was a head coach. I don't think Charlie Weiss was a head coach. There are certain personalities where you, you, know, you have to be ready for that. You can be a great coordinator. That doesn't make you a great coach. And I, I think sometimes we get caught up in, oh, you got to give them a head coaching job. It doesn't mean that, and plus, I think with African Americans, minorities, they have even more pressure to succeed because if they don't succeed, then it hurts the next one, and you, it's going to hurt your chance to get another one. So, it, it's a, I mean, there's a lot there to unravel, but uh, I, I don't know if we have a great answer right now. Hey, Dan, one key area of focus that I think the NFL needs to really be looking at is the entry level dynamics. You got a lot of nepotism, you got a lot of cronyism, yeah. and you got teams that do not pay a living wage to the lowest level employees. That's a point Chris Sims made today on PFTOT because he was one of those low level guys who was making peanuts in that first level job. Not everyone can say, sure, I'll work for nothing. Guys have families. Guys don't have football money in the bank like Chris Sims had. Guys don't have Phil Sims money as a fallback like Chris Sims had. 
You can't just say, sure, I'll work 18 hours a day for nothing if I got a family at home that I have to worry about. It eliminates a lot of guys that otherwise could be very good at that job. Maybe they need to pay more money on the way in the door, and it will attract a more diverse group of candidates. Always great to talk to you, Michael. Thank you, buddy. All right, Dan. See you, pal. That's Mike Florio, Pro Football Talk Live, co-host with Chris Sims, also ProFootballTalk.com.